Dick, obviously Harley Davidson is very serious about their their, their racing and, uh, and and getting out there and winning and promoting their product. They've always been serious. They've been very serious since 1914, and they've been in the racing steady all the time. And we feel it's very important part of the sport of motorcycling. Really, you have a lot of appeal to your people on the street. That want to see the same as you do in all type of racing. They're very brand conscious. They want to see racing motorcycle. They want to see their brand leading the pack. Founded in 1903, Harley-Davidson and the history of American motorsport cannot be separated. In the first decade of the 20th century, the motor company concentrated on making the most reliable, rugged, and technically advanced motorcycles for a price riders could afford. At the same time, their customers and dealers were starting a tradition that continues to this day. They were racing and winning. The first competitive events that Harley-Davidson contested were long-distance reliability trials, proving to a still skeptical world the potential of these new machines. Next came speed and an important evolution of America's love affair with velocity. Huge banked wooden motor drones, some over a mile long, were built to host motorcycle races. By 1926, 1,000 cc V-twin Harley-Davidsons were reaching speeds of 120 miles per hour with no brakes. Motordromes and their daredevil riders attracted immense crowds, but were expensive and horrifically dangerous when things went wrong and were soon abandoned. A safer option of racing flat, dirt fairground tracks became the preferred option and one still used to this day. From day one, Harley-Davidson had a battle on their hands. First, there were the domestic manufacturers looking to win on Sunday and sell on Monday to a nation on the move. The competition arrived, all looking to knock the Milwaukee Twins off the top spot. But more often than not, Harley-Davidson's racing bikes won the coveted national championship. By the late 1960s, new racing rules affected engine size and internals, allowing the British manufacturers to increase the capacity of their more modern motors. The rule change was just what the imports needed, but Harley-Davidson racers like Mert Lawwell were still competing and winning championships with the Harley-Davidson KR750. The incredibly successful KR750 was introduced in 1952 and was dominant for 17 years. With hard work and sheer determination, Mert Lawwell fought off the improved European race bikes and won the national championship in 1969 against motorcycles that were improving constantly while the KR750 was becoming outdated. The rules had been changed at the AMA they went to uh, uh, 750 across the board, so we knew that we had to have a, a motorcycle to compete in that series. And uh, the KR was a flathead, even though it was 750, it wasn't fast enough to stick up, stay up with the, uh, with the overhead valve machines. Well, the KR was one of the dominant brands in flat track racing. It, it raced against the British twins. The, the competition congress said, okay, uh, starting next year, we're going to be 750 across the board. Everybody's going to be 750. Going forward, Harley-Davidson knew they had to modernize to stay on top.
For the 1970 season, the Harley-Davidson Racing Department took elements of the recently retired KR750 and the company's Sportster road bike to create its new competition machine, the XR750. The first generation XR750s are known as the Iron XRs because of their cast iron barrels and heads. The template was set. 45 degree V-twin push rod actuated overhead valves and a chassis that was a subtle development of the old KR750. The Iron XRs showed power and potential, but weakness too. The iron parts that gave the bike its nickname were also its Achilles heel. During demanding 25 mile long races, the highly stressed motor couldn't dissipate heat as well as the competition's engines. Yeah, the Iron XR was bad because it was never intended to be a race engine. It was intended to be a street motor and they just uh, de-stroked it and made it legal displacement wise so that, that it could run. Now, they knew right from the beginning that, that, that the Iron XR was only a temporary fix, but it was never intended for racing at all by the design engineers. When you're a racer, you don't want anything to fail or anything to stop. I mean, you want to win, win, win. So anything that gets in the way of that, why you get very upset about engine failures, as you know, by watching on any Sunday, it took us out. They were better than the K's power-wise, but they had a lot of problems in areas with heat retention because the cylinders and heads were cast iron, and we were constantly chasing problems, and even when you got the the lower end problems fixed, the heat retention was still very problematic. All the while knowing that ultimately we'd have to go to an aluminum version of this engine. The plans were being made and the cast iron XR was just kind of a, a stop gap to get to the aluminum XR. The Harley-Davidson Racing Department knew they had to fix it. By the start of the 1972 season, the new Alloy XR750 was introduced, and it changed the sport forever. With young Californian Mark Brelsford on board, the Alloy XR750 won the Grand National Championship in 1972, its first season out. I loved it. It was great. It ran all day long. <laughs> We knew right away that that was the, the way to go and it was going to be good for some time. I mean, already it was faster than, than the Iron one. It handled good because it was lighter. It just was light years ahead of the Iron XR. Well, in its first year, it won the championship. I think it got second at its first race, won the second race. It just revolutionized flat track racing. It just had so much power. It was like, a, it was just like a big tractor, you know, it just hooked up. Now you have this purpose-built motorcycle that is made to run more like a tractor to where you can be in the throttle. You have to like think ahead with it and it builds this type of torquey power that is totally different feel in your hand. You could ride it so hard and the thing would hook up and work better and better and better. What I like most about the XR750 is it's a fun bike to ride. Uh, as you flick it off in the corner at a buck 30, it, it's a riot. The biggest advantage that the XR750 had was the gyroscopic forces created through the crankshaft. It's a V-twin, so its cylinders are firing like this, so the gyroscopic forces are going forward, and that was a big advantage for the majority of its life. This motorcycle was form and balance, a pure racer. Being a V-twin and not firing on every stroke, why it had better traction, made it hook up good to compete against the British brands on dirt track racing. And the British twins were, from the racing standpoint, they were going to a gunfight with a knife and, and they pretty much knew it. The, the, the Harley was just too easy to ride too fast, too user-friendly, and there was just too many of them. Harley-Davidson's flat track legend had arrived.
In 1973, a new threat joined the Harley-Davidsons and the still-strong British bikes. Kenny Roberts won back-to-back -back titles with Yamaha before the XR750 fought back with Gary Scott for the 1975 championship title. The next year, Harley-Davidson brought in an 18-year-old from Flint, Michigan, Jay Springsteen. The second of three sons, young Jay rode in the draft of his older brother, Kenny, collecting literally hundreds of amateur titles, including the National Amateur Crown at 13. The Grand National Circuit will now move east to what Jay Springsteen figures are his kinds of racetracks, and after a disappointing start, his hopes for the championship are very much alive. At the time, Jay Springsteen was the youngest winner of a Grand National main event at the age of 18 just two weeks past his 18th birthday. Springsteen's induction to the team could not have been better. He and Harley-Davidson's race mechanic and XR750 development guru, Bill Werner, were a winning partnership. Well, I had seen Jay race uh, before, and I knew he was a phenomenal talent, you know. Uh, I didn't know much about him personally, other than that he seemed like kind of a wild and crazy guy, uh, kind of fun to be around and whatnot. My first impression is when they brought him up to Harley-Davidson to uh, fit him up for the Houston TT. Springer comes ambling into the shop and I says, okay, we got the bike over here, you know, I gotta figure out if you want the, you know, the rear brake on the right side or the left side or what kind of handlebars you want. And he said, well, where's the bike the last guy rode? And I said, well, it's over here. He got on it and he said, yeah, that's good. Right then I knew I was gonna love the guy. <laughs> the Harley-Davidson factory called me and I was just 18 right out of high school. In my very first year, uh, I become number one. When I was on my bike, I was at ease. I was comfortable on my bike. I was just a natural. Everything comes so easy to me, you know. And I was one with the motorcycle. I mean, I felt like I could do anything on that motorcycle. He's the type of guy, when he goes out on the racetrack, He's usually going fast as he can. Jay just seems like whatever you put him on, he just goes out there and, and goes his speed right from the beginning of the day. The bike's running really great. I'm, I'm confident in myself, and the racetrack is just beautiful. You don't even have to shut her off. Just wide open all the way around. What I saw was the, one of the most naturally gifted flat track motorcycle riders ever. He looked like he was having fun, and the faster he went, the more relaxed he looked. I just did it for the fun of it. You know, I learned how to go around the circles in my front yard is when I learned how to ride a motorcycle. And then I just kept going from there to there. And, and it was like, which one of you guys are gonna get second? Cause I'm winning. <laughs> That's just the way I felt. Jay Springsteen earned the coveted number one plate three years in a row. He was the fastest, bravest, and most natural rider on the grid. And he knew how to tell Bill Werner exactly what he needed. I had the best equipment from the factory, and I had Bill Werner as my mechanic, and him and I could talk, and I could tell him what the motorcycle was doing. And him being a previous racer himself, he kind of knew what to do to make the motorcycle better and made it go more than its ability. <laughs> Following on the heels of Springsteen's trio of titles, four different riders achieved championship winning seasons on the Harley-Davidson XR750. Steve Eklund, Mike Kidd, Ricky Graham, and two for Randy Goss. But another formidable factory was looking for their own flat track glory. Honda used the XR750 as a blueprint for their own prototype race bike. Their brand new 750 looked a lot like Harley-Davidson's design. Two exhausts exiting on the left, two carbs pointing straight back on the right. The Japanese bike's bore and stroke was remarkably similar as well. 
Then Honda added some of their Grand Prix road racing know-how and an unprecedented budget to ensure they won. They came in with the overhead cam instead of the pushrod engine like the Hex R was. They just made a Honda, but it was a copy of a Harley. You know, my feelings and you know, they took over, the Hondas kind of took over in that area for a while. And then the XR was still competitive. The only thing really special about it was that it had two more valves per cylinder and allowed it to run at higher RPMs in the 80s when we were capped at about 85 or 8600. It could go to 9 or 9200. And then, you know, somewhere in the middle of that, the restrictor plates were introduced and to try and level the field between the XR and the RS. And the restrictor plates kind of leveled it back out. And I'd say it, it hurt horsepower on the Harleys. I think it hurt the rideability on the Honda more. And then they came in and dominated and got out of it. They come in and prove their point and left. <laughs> As the 1980s dawned, Harley Davidson and Bill Werner put their faith in another Michigan rookie to join the factory racing team. This rider was Scott Parker. Parker was the youngest rider ever to earn an expert license at the age of 17. We had a short, real short career as a novice and went into the juniors, ended up winning the junior national championship, and then from the junior was the expert class. And I'm thinking these experts can't be that much, that much faster, you know. But when, once we went to Houston Astrodome and I didn't make neither main event, put my tail between my legs and went on home, you know, it was one of them things that made me think, oh man, they, these guys, these guys mean business. Jay's teammate, Scott Parker, prepares for his eat. As the newest member of the Harley-Davidson team, Scott Parker, number 11, feels an additional pressure to perform, to prove himself. And he does. Parker, following Jay's lead, wins his heat, but by a very narrow margin. How's it work, partner? It's good, working good. Uh, Looks like you got a lot more rubber left than what we had. I was I high low in the corner. I car. never shut off. I know it, the whole race, you don't have to. If you go in the corner, it's just wanting to pick up on you. Parker was performing well on his XR750 and learning as much as he could from his friend and teammate, Jay Springsteen. In 1985, Harley-Davidson riders had to hire their own mechanics. Scott Parker had only one mechanic in mind, Bill Werner. It would be a few years before Parker and Werner won their first Grand National Championship. Then the floodgates opened. Good. 
Scott Parker dominated the sport with nine championship titles between 1988 and 1998. His record of 94 national race wins and nine grand national championships still stands, cementing Scott Parker and the XR750s he rode as the greatest of all time. With the help of Bill Werner, Scott Parker and his XR750s were dominant for a decade. Bill Warner is a genius. He can take and build the motorcycle from top to bottom. He does every aspect of it and then understands the geometry of how the bikes should be working. Bill Werner had now won a total of 13 Grand National Championships as a mechanic for Harley-Davidson. More than any tuner in the history of the sport. While Scott Parker was dominating the sport, a new competitor was learning from his losses and was gaining confidence. Chris Carr was the Rookie of the Year in 1985. In 1989, Chris Carr became a factory Harley-Davidson rider. Carr's close battles with Parker made for some of the greatest racing the sport had ever seen. Scott was a, he was a great racer. He always knew where to be at the right time in order to propel himself to the checkered flag. That's why he's got 94 wins. So the guy won a lot of races on the XR. That guy, the number one on his plate, just plain hauling ass. We got our hands full today. Little, little, little choked up because we wanted it bad, but we just didn't get it tonight. For me, it was frustrating. I, I finished second to the guy like 31 times in my career. Uh, it's no uh, one-year project. Can we miss it? That to me, while frustrating, also developed me. A lot of those lessons I learned getting my butt beat by him, I applied to the next generation of racers. Scotty Parker, he's, uh, he's one hell of a champion. He worked his butt off this year and uh, deserves to be champion. I credit him with the, with the most of my success because I learned a lot getting beat by the guy. With the help of his own master tuner, Kenny Tolbert, Chris Carr was getting faster. And more importantly, he was winning. I feel better than ever. I think it's going to be a good year for uh, Chris Carr and the Harley Davidson racing team. And um, hopefully the number one plate will trade hands within the Harley pit. Carr pushed Parker harder than any other rider and would win seven grand national championships of his own. I did what I had to do to win the championship. I, uh, I give a lot of credit to Scotty Parker. He's, uh, he's one hell of a competitor. Um, I only hope that in the years to come I can be the type of champion that he's become in our sport. He's, uh, he's set, the, set the standard for the rest of us to learn from. He's one heck of a competitor and, uh, and uh, we hope to see him back next year. Good man. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. Congratulations. When Jay Springsteen, Scott Parker, and Chris Carr retired, they carried off 19 number one plates between them. But their departure didn't dent the XR750's ability to win. It just made the title race that much harder to predict. In its fourth decade at the top of the sport, the XR750 was still dominating and still winning championships. Joe Kopp. Kenny Coolbeth, Jared Meese, Jake Johnson, and Brad Baker all took turns at winning the number one plate. And all of them did it with the help of the Milwaukee V-Twin, an engine design that was now older than every pro who was racing it. After we were done racing, the XR was still a dominant motorcycle. As we got older, they brought the new, younger kids coming up, you know, that were fearless, you know, like I was. It still tended to be the, the bike of choice 
because there were so many out there and there were a lot of uh, active teams using it. Everybody had one and everybody knew how to work on one. Its dominance as the championship winning bike went well beyond my career. Now, with 37 Grand National Championships and 47 years of racing, the XR750 was not done winning. The American Flat Track Series rolled into Texas for the penultimate race of the year with the usual field of the world's best dirt track riders on a new generation of flat track machines. Jeffrey Carver Jr., a privateer from Illinois who slept in his van to ensure his race budget stretched as far as possible, had decided this track suited his Harley-Davidson XR750. We showed up with one XR in a van, and we really thought that it was the powerhouse that could take on the Indians, and that's whenever 2017 the factory Indian teams came in. The track was a little skittery, dry, slick, everybody was on edge a little bit, but I showed up there in the mentality to, to, to win, that's what we were there for, and the way that we were able to run the bike compared to the Indians or the Cowies is that we could pull a different gear and have the thing run at a lower RPM. What made that bike work so well there is that you could roll in and use that torquey power and the power pulses to make it where it hooks up and build momentum and kind of use it like, you know, the XR has always been momentum and it's building and it's like, you know, a rope with a string on it. You know, everything, once rotation gets up, that's where an XR works really well. On the back straightaway, Jeffrey Carver stretching out the lead on the XR 750. Pretty interesting, there's two 18 wheelers per team, you know, and we show up in one van packed in there with one bike and was able to beat, beat all the top teams. On the turn number four, Jeffrey Carver Jr. takes the win on the Harley-Davidson XR 750. I mean, it was amazing. It was 100% amazing to win it. It was just like a part of the journey, you know, it was like our place to do it and our timing. Lo and behold, at that time, uh, you know, another brand comes out with a bike that, that is essentially a modern version of the XR750. Yet, despite that, an XR750 still wins at the hands of Carver. You know, Jeffrey, he's kind of a throwback kid. He has a, a big appreciation for the, you know, the historical value in, in the sport of flat track. You know, he's developed into one of the top riders on the circuit and, you know, he, he's, uh, he's credited today as the last winner on an XR750. I can think of no better ambassador for that honor than a kid like him who, who really appreciates what all of us did prior to him. There have been a thousand experiments and hundreds of detail changes, but the XR750 that was still winning in 2017 is closely related to the one Mark Brelsford first won the title with in 1972. Tuners took an engine created in 1970 from 75 horsepower to over 100 horsepower, all hoping to win on a grid full of XR750s. The combined knowledge of the world's most famous motorcycle manufacturer and dozens of independent tuners and teams, all desperate to win, kept the XR750 competitive and successful for half a century. Add to that the fearless riding and unwavering commitment of generations of flat track racers, and you have what it takes to make an icon. I enjoyed so much back then riding the XR, you know, it was, it was, I felt so comfortable on the motorcycle. I felt like I could do anything with that motorcycle. And Harley has always had a race team, you know, for all these years. And it was the bike to have, you know. Um, you know, if you wasn't on a Harley, you wasn't gonna win. Man, you know, it's been since 85 since I won my last national. 
That's a long time. I'm so happy, I don't know what to say, really. You know, after its long, long tenure as a race engine, everything else would be compared to it. Any sport that has a dominant team for a long time, they, they become the measuring stick. And, and in flat track racing, you know, the XR750 is that measuring stick that all other types of bikes will be compared to because of its long uh, history of success. Racing engines don't last that long. You know, they, they just get obsolete by their design. Harley did a lot of good research and, and work for that XR. You know, they built it for dirt track racing. When they built that motor, that's what they built it for. Then they just kept developing it and kept developing it. You know, you can go back to the 72 and put it on the one that won in 2017. You know, that's the unique thing about it is the pieces were there. It's the bike. It, it's been the bike. It's been there forever. That's why it's been number one so many times. Harley Davidson got it right. That engine, you know, withstood the test of time. It was a type of engine that you could change with the times. It's had every technology, racing technology, for nearly 50 years thrown at it. The reality is you look back over the results. I mean, it won races in flat track for 45 years. There's no other racing engine in any other sport that can say anywhere near that. This is the story of one motorcycle that entered the world winning, and 50 years later, proved it still could. There has never been another racing motorcycle like Harley-Davidson's XR750.